Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie. So, because during last week's episode of Game of Thrones we got a big White Walker surprise, I wanted to do my bonus video this week about the last great war with them called The Long Night and the building of the wall with Bran the Builder. One of the things I really like about the show is that a lot of the history is conveyed anecdotally. That is, when one character makes a reference to another character or someone reads something in a book inside the book. So that's where a lot of our information about the White Walkers, you know, even dragons comes from. If you're finding me for the first time, I'm just doing a series of special bonus videos to celebrate season four. Be sure to subscribe to get everything and feel free to suggest, you know, future bonus topics to me. My episode five review will post after that episode airs tonight. So what I'm going to do is talk about the long night first and then brand the builder building the wall and then three, you know, up to where we are right here. One of the really funny things on the show is that a lot of characters like Jon Snow know nothing of the long night. Remember when old Nan made that sweet summer child speech during season one? She was talking to Bran because he'd been born during the long summer. The world of Game of Thrones is a little weird in that seasons last for indeterminate amounts of time. So the summer as of season one has basically lasted for about 10 years. Right now where we are on the show, you know, right after the Purple Wedding is officially kind of the start of winter or unofficially. They haven't really said, you know, winter is here. People are very vague about when seasons come and go. But I think that's one of the reasons why Dan and Dave chose to include this scene, you know, because the White Walkers live in the lands of always winter. So it just implies that winter is basically here, whether people know it or not. The Long Night was a little bit different in terms of seasons in that it was a period of extreme darkness that lasted for an entire generation. So it was more than just a long winter. And when I say generation, I think we can assume based on life expectancy that it was about, you know, maybe like 50 or 60 years. Whenever we first learned about the long winter during season one, Nan was actually trying to tell Bran a story about Brandon the Builder, the person he's named after. That was his Stark ancestor that built the wall at the end of the long night. That was during the time of the First Men. Remember during season two, the Night's Watch visited the fist of the First Men when Jon Snow split off with Egret and Sam saw the White Walker for the first time. So we don't know a lot about what happened, you know, in the middle or the beginning of the Long Night, but we do know about its end, and that involved a person called the Last Hero. Whenever you look at his triumph over the White Walkers, he sounds a lot like Melisandre's version of Azor Ahai, just someone who saves the world from darkness. There's some books about him at the Night's Watch that talk about the Obsidian Blades being able to hurt White Walkers, but we really only learn about that as Samwell learns about it, so I'm hoping we get to see him in the library more. And one of the biggest problems right now is that all the books that were written were not written during that original time. They were written thousands of years after those events happened by maesters and other scholars. So a lot of it could also be false. In the chronology of the show, The Long Night was actually about 8,000 years ago, or ended about 8,000 years ago. The Children of the Forest were also a big part of that time in history. Technically, it's referred to as the Age of Heroes. That began whenever the First Men signed the pact with the Children to end a different war, it's believed that when the last hero ended the Long Night, he did so only with the help of the children. So again, we only learn about these types of things whenever characters in the show tell it to other characters, you know, or we hear a legend. I'm hoping that a lot of George R. R. Martin's new literature will actually cover some of these periods in history so he can fill in the gaps, you know, and officially sign stuff into canon. Here's where we need to talk about the wall and Bran the Builder though. He was the founder of House Stark. We know he was alive at the end of the Long Night, but I can't confirm that he was present at the signing of the pact between the Children of the Forest and the First Men. There's really no official timeline for those events. Yet. So the rumors say that whenever Brandon started building the wall, he did so with the help of the Giants and probably the Wildlings too. After a war like the Long Night, you can imagine that most people probably put their differences aside, so anyone who was not a servant of the Great Other probably helped build the wall. There are also supposedly magic runes and wards that protect it, but we haven't really learned anything official about that. So just to dispel any misconceptions about what the wall is actually made of, yes, it is made of ice, but they did use a lot of the natural mountain ranges to provide some of the foundation. Supposedly, those big blocks of ice that were used were quarried from the lakes in the haunted forest, and the wall just slowly got bigger over the centuries, meaning that when it was first built, during Brandon's lifetime, it was way smaller. I just think that's a much more plausible explanation, you know, that the Night's Watch just slowly built it up over the centuries. For example, it took the Great Wall of China about 2,000 years to finish being built. So obviously they did not have the help of frost giants, so you could probably shave off a couple hundred years for the wall on Game of Thrones. When it was first started, the Night's Watch, you know, had an entire army of men helping out. And at its biggest, it was about 10,000 men strong, serving in 19 castles all along the wall. Right now, they're at a fraction of that, and they're only manning three castles. It's the Shadow Tower, Castle Black, and East Watch. 
they're basically, you know, three castles that are equidistant from each other, you know, from the westernmost part of the wall to the easternmost part, with Castle Black being smack dab in the middle. So more about magic as it applies to the wall, you know, right now on the show, in season two, Mance Raider talked about something called the Horn of Winter that's supposedly supposed to bring the wall down. But that's just a legend. We don't know if it's true. The horn belonged to Yorman, the Wildling King, that helped defeat the Night's King, you know, way, way long time ago. Originally, it was said that the horn was used to call giants to him. But as the legend goes, it's also supposed to be able to bring the wall down. But really, that could just be a literal interpretation of, you know, making the giants smash it down. The actual physical horn that Mance claims to have found is about eight feet long, and it does have runes of the first men on it. The thing I really like about the show and the books are that because most of the information is passed along in the form of a legend, there's really no way to know what's true and what's been fabricated. We do know that dragons exist, and we know that magic exists. We also saw that the White Walkers have a very real culture and a home of their own, you know, way up in the lands of Always Winter. You can actually see it here on the map, just to give you an idea of how far away it is from the rest of Westeros and the Wall. As you can see, based on the distance from the Wall to Winterfell, you know, their supposed home isn't that far away. But they are separated by, you know, this great mountain range. Small comfort. So it's basically been implied that, you know, since the time of the Night King, they've just been slowly rebuilding their ranks. We don't know how big their army is, but in my last video, you know, my Night's King q and I speculated that because Craster has sacrificed all 99 of his sons, there's at least 100 White Walkers, if you include the Night's King. They do raise Whites to form their infantry, but we don't know if every White Walker possesses the same magic as the Night's King, but I would assume yes. Mostly because I think of them like I think of Melisandre and Thoros being servants of the Red God. Each of them have the same powers, even if their specialties are a little bit different. You know, Melisandre can conjure visions and fire and birth shadow babies, and Thoros can bring people back to the life. I would assume that the White Walkers each have their own specialties too. So we're probably not going to learn about that until George R. R. Martin writes more books or we get future seasons of the show, but let me know, what are you looking forward to learning most about the culture of the White Walkers and their magic, you know, either on the show or in the books? In related news, my episode 5 video will post tonight. Be sure to subscribe to get it, you know, right after episode 5 airs. And because round 5 of the giveaway starts and I'm getting ready to hit 200,000 subscribers and I'm so happy and you guys have been so awesome, I'm going to double the giveaway so I'm giving away two gift certificates. But I'll explain that more whenever I post that episode 5 video. Right now you can click here to get that review video. I'll update the annotation as soon as I post it. And you can click here to get my Night's King Q&A. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you guys tonight. High fives.